James chapter 3 in a moment. But uh, before we get there, just to say a little bit about what we're going to be looking at uh, in the next couple of weeks. We are uh, beginning a new series called I Life, a virtual life in a virtual world or living a virtuous life in a virtual age. I don't know if you realize that we are all pioneers. Do you feel like a pioneer? We are living at the beginning, at the dawn of a new age. It's the digital age. Did you know that access to mobile communication technology is advancing at an unprecedented rate? There has never been anything like it before. For the last, in the first decade of the 21st century, uh, there were 350 million people online in the year 2000. By 2010, there were 2 billion people online. There were 750 million mobile users in the year 2000. Now, there are 6 billion mobile users in the world. I was struck when I went to Uganda and realized that everybody in the room had a mobile phone and were not afraid to use it. By 2025, the majority of the world will be online. They will have access to unfiltered information in the palm of their hands. What an extraordinary thought that is. Did you know every minute of every day, there are 48 hours of new YouTube videos uploaded onto YouTube? Every minute of every day, there are over 200 million text messages sent. There are 2 million Google search queries. Facebook users share over 680,000 pieces of content every minute of every day. You know who you are. Brands and organizations on Facebook receive 35,000 likes every minute of every day. No wonder the advertisers want to get onto Facebook. 27,000 new posts are posted just on Tumblr. That's a blog site, for those of you who don't know. Every minute of every day. And 100,000 tweets are sent. Every minute of every day. Hands up if you have no idea what I'm talking about at all. Good. Because, of course, as I expected, this changes everything. When we were thinking about this, we, were, we thought, can we do a whole series on the digital age and what it means to be a disciple in the digital age? And one person said, well, maybe it's just worth just one talk and that will be enough, won't it? And then as you begin to unpack it, you realize that it changes everything, the age in which we live. Uh, Jonathan Friedland, a Guardian uh, columnist, said this in an article this week, I once thought the world of the internet would be the same as before, only faster. In fact, it's altering every corner of human life. The world we live in will never be the same again. What does it mean, though, for all of us? We're, probably most of us here are digital immigrants. If you were born after 1980, You've got used to this new age in which you live, but you can remember the information age, the age before the digital age. But increasingly, most of us are digital natives. I was struck with Amelia, how for her, the iPad was just natural. It was second nature to her. She picked it up. She was multi-touch. She switched a few pages over, found the app that she wanted, and was into Peppa Pig in a second. So how do you live a virtuous life in a virtual age. How do you make disciples in the digital age? And over these six weeks, we're going to be using the book of James to kind of springboard off into a number of different issues. Next week, we're calling it I Desire, and Darren is going to be looking at online pornography. What does it mean that actually... <laughs> I'm so glad you're all awake. <laughs> and so are we. <laughs> I'll try not to get the giggles for that one. The issue of online pornography. And what it means that we can access this stuff in a way that for many of us growing up, we couldn't. Where there's no shame, no fear, you can do it in the privacy of your own home. What does that mean for our children when those sites are only a couple of clicks away? 
Uh, we're going to look at iSurf. What is the impact of the digital age on how we learn? What does Google do to our brains? And we realize actually we, we're all of us outsourcing our memories and we're learning not to think about something deeply, but we're learning to skim read, to find things, but not to remember things. We're going to look at I like. What does the digital age do to our identity? What's the impact of Facebook where we are constantly presenting ourselves to others where we are being defined by the boxes that we fill in, but we're also trying to define ourselves as we create platforms for lots of friends to see us. We're going to look at I consume and the impact of Amazon and the power of advertising and how the internet shapes our very wants and needs. And finally, we're going to bring it all back together with this idea of the I life. What does it mean to be the church in the digital age? What does it mean to be a flesh and blood community interacting one with another face to face? But this morning we are starting with I share. And we're going to begin in the middle of the book of James, which is kind of the fulcrum point really. And uh, we're going to be looking at chapter three. And uh, I share is all about communication. And James has a lot to say about the tongue. So if you want to turn with me to chapter 3 of James, it's page 1147. We're going to start reading at verse 3 of chapter 3. Page 1148, rather, sorry. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue is also a fire. A world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole person, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by human beings. But no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. So keep your finger in there if you would. What we're looking at today is this idea of I share. Human beings are made to share. Human beings are made to communicate. Uh, positive psychology uh, was developed as a discipline in order to answer the question, not what's gone wrong with you, but what makes you happy? And they did a lot of research about what makes human beings happy. Uh, they asked, was it more money? And the resounding uh, answer was, no, it's not more money. Was it better weather? I would personally have said yes to that uh, question, but the overall response was no, it's not better weather. The conclusion for these positive psychologists was what made us happy was, quote, significant social ties to friends and family. What makes human beings happy is connection. And those of us who read our Bibles aren't surprised by that, are we? Because the Bible says the same thing. It says God is a God who communicates. He wants to know us. He speaks. He has something to say. He wants to be in relationship with us. And he has made us in his image. And we communicate and we want to be in relationship with him and with one another too. You see, the digital age is essentially about communication. Whether that is your mobile phone or your smartphone, whether that's the emails you send or the text messages, whether it's Facebook or Twitter that you like or, or Skype or FaceTime that you rely upon, whether you are a blogger or you upload your photos to Instagram or Pinterest or Tumblr, whatever it may be, what you are doing is communicating. All of those are new ways of communicating with one another. 
But the question we have to ask ourselves is how do they change the way we communicate? What impact do these new forms of communication have on our hearts? And what we're going to see are two things we're going to look at. We're going to look at the, how this communication is, is accelerating. It's faster than a speeding bullet. And we're going to look at how this communication enables community, but in a new way. Now you see me, now you don't. So let's start with faster than a speeding bullet and watch this video. A bit of product placement there. If you think you share your life now on Facebook, wait for Google Glass, I think. And you can see from that that communication means loads more information. We're going to be processing information constantly, increasingly, as we enter the digital age. Communication is accelerating. Like Superman, it is becoming faster than a speeding bullet. Processor chips inside the computer double in speed every single 18, every 18 months. And that means that a, a computer in 2025 will be 64 times faster than a computer today. Yes, the speed of fiber optic cables doubles every nine months. And we are going to have uh, instant access to huge amounts of content. We're going to see uh, pervasive communication. We are always going to be online. Mobile technology already allows us to be in touch with anyone, anywhere, to be online whenever or wherever we are. And for many, that is liberating. It is revolutionary. We've seen that uh, with the Arab Spring. We are seeing it on the streets of Brazil this week, where protests and revolution have been organized because people have access to information like never before. But what drives this acceleration? Well, the first thing is, we as human beings need to know. We want to access information quickly, don't we? We want others to communicate with us. We want to be informed. We want to be in the know. We don't want to miss out. And so we are constantly updated and notified and our phones ping and make other strange noises. In fact, just as I was preparing uh, this talk, my uh, mobile buzzed next to me, and the Y-Plan app said to me, do you want an adventure this weekend? Uh, but it might be Twitter, and you check your Twitter to see what's going on, to try and ensure that you've got, you're the first to know about a, a significant news item that's suddenly breaking. Or maybe for you it's Feedly and you look and see all your blog rolls and see the different articles that have been written. And it can lead to us constantly checking emails, checking texts, checking Twitter or Facebook updates, and we never switch off. I wonder if you're like that. But not only do we need to know, we need to be known. And so we want to pass on information more quickly too. We want to communicate with others, don't we? We want others to be informed about us. And so we want to share our own lives. And, and often, you're, if you're a regular on Facebook, you see people's Facebook updates, their shares, their likes, the comments that come back and forth. Or perhaps for you, it's uh, tweeting, uh, or again, just posting photos on Pinterest or Instagram. We want more friends, we want more followers, we want more fans, don't we? But why do we feel the need to communicate so much so quickly? It's because we need, to be, we need to know and we need to be known. But James here counsels caution, doesn't he? Verse 6 says, The tongue is also a fire, a world of evil among the, body, the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole person, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. Chapter, tw uh, verse, chapter 1, verse 26 said, those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves and their religion is worthless. And James here sits within this Old Testament context of wisdom. And the wisdom writers have a lot to say about tongues. If you uh, read the book of Proverbs, you'll hear things like this. Whoever restrains his lips is prudent. Or, whoever keeps his mouth and his tongue keeps himself out of trouble. And so when you have this desire to communicate, which is not wrong, make sure you have something to say. Make sure 
that something to say is worth saying. And when you say it, choose your words carefully. In the digital age, communication is faster than a speeding bullet. Communication means more information because we need to know and we need to be known. But it's not just about information. It's also about community. Now you see me, now you don't. Watch this clip. Who hasn't taken a photo of a jellyfish in ultraviolet light? There's not many of us left, I don't think. Have you got your phone? Got a smartphone in particular? I just want you to take it out if you would. And hold it up. I want you to take a photo of me, if that's okay. We got it? <laughs> Man, there's a lot of you. <laughs> Hang on a second. Uh, have I got? No, I haven't got time. Right, okay, here we go. I'm going to take a photo there and there. And if I had, there we go. Panorama, here we go. Awesome. I should go that way. Love it. Done. Brilliant. Now, you may have seen when the Pope. Uh, was presented at St. Peter's, uh, there was a lot of news about the fact that everybody was doing what you guys were just doing. Everybody had their phones up like this or like that. Uh, they had their iPads. I always find it odd when people take photos with iPads, don't you? It seems to be a bit large to me. Um, the Queen at the BBC just recently, it wasn't a sea of screens. She was mobbed by mobiles as m kind of uh, uh, employees walked around with her with their phones snapping all the time. We have this sense, don't we, that communication means community. So uh, Joanne and I and my dad, he was visiting last week, and uh, we went out for lunch in uh, Canary Wharf, and my brother's in Australia, and uh, we enjoyed a lot of the photos he uploaded onto Facebook for us when dad was there uh, a few months ago. So we thought, right, immediately snap a photo of Joanne, Orla, and my dad enjoying some pasta at Jamie's Italian. And uh, Joanne just said, oh, you put the phone away. Can we not just enjoy the moment? And funnily enough, there was a BBC article this week that asked the question, are we failing to live in the moment because we are too busy trying to capture the moment? I think there's a lot of truth in that. It's actually uh, a phenomenon that's got a name. It's called ambient intimacy. And I really, it struck me the other day when I was having uh, lunch with the vicar general, a guy called Nick Mercer, who I've known for about 15 years. And uh, we're both on Facebook, so we know lots about each other. But we realized that though we felt like we were keeping in touch the whole time, actually we hadn't spoken to each other face to face for over 10 years. And it didn't feel like that at all. You know, for, for us, our relationship was mediated through status updates, uh, uploading photos, comments, uh, shares that we had made on Facebook. There's this drive for relationship, drive for community. But what is it that drives that? Well, the first thing I think is that we need to be loved. And of course, intimacy, relationship, is a good thing. FaceTime and Skype make my relationship with my brother in Australia much easier. I'm sure Liz and Stuart are thankful for Skype. Facebook does help you to stay in touch. It helps you to rediscover old friends and acquaintances that you've lost touch with. But have you ever noticed that the distance that is really there in those media the absence, the fact you're not really there with them, makes intimacy hard work. You have to be intentionally intimate, don't you? You have to share things about yourself. You have to think then about the things that you want to share, knowing that everyone else is going to see them. You have to think about the thoughts you're going to share. You have to think about the feelings you're going to share. You have to think about the events in your life that you want people to know about. So to do community online, you have to think about yourself much more than when you're doing community offline. You have to be intentional. There's a lot more effort. There's a lot more hard work. You can't just be. If you're someone who just is online and you sit and look at the computer and never post anything, people will accuse you of lurking. 
And that's not a good thing. But of course, this level of self-reflection can become self-obsession. So we need to be loved. But also we need to love. And this is where I really want to say that face-to-face still matters. There is an article in the New York Times this week that says, technology celebrates connectedness, but actually encourages retreat. And what we're seeing in our culture is that we prefer online communication to real-world communication. Did you know 50% of 16 to 34-year-olds actually take their laptop, their iPad, or their mobile phone to bed with them and use it? I do that. I just confess it to you. Young people increasingly find that online chat is less threatening and uh, safer and more efficient than online um, face-to-face communication. And you can often find young people in the same room just texting each other across the room because it's an easier thing to do. And if we're honest, we all know that, don't we? We, we? You can pick up a phone and we get the voicemail and we think to ourselves just for a second, oh, that's good, I can just leave a short message. Or we just now just text people instead and let them know that we're going to be late because it's much easier to phone them and say, I'm so sorry that I'm running a bit late. Uh, or, we, or we prefer email. Those kind of more distant communications are, are easier for us. And of course, technology distracts us even when we are face-to-face with others. So we find that we take calls. I remember a South African friend of mine uh, was the first person to admit offence when we were having dinner together, and I answered my mobile phone. I was probably on the phone for 10 seconds. I put the phone down, and he said, Rod, that offends me that you don't want to spend time with me. And I thought, oh, goodness, I didn't even think about that for a moment. We send and receive texts, don't we, when we are with each other. Uh, We check our updates uh, at the dinner table. We check our updates when we're playing with our children. We uh, see what the news is or what emails we've received. First thing we get up in the morning and then just as we're going to bed at night, what do we do? We just check Facebook to see if there's anything interesting there. And what it means, of course, is that we're no longer present. We're no longer paying attention to the people that we are with. And this New York Times article argued that what you see is it's teaching you slowly but surely actually not to care. As you distance yourself from others, slowly but surely, even though we need to love, we forget how to love. And that's why James counsels, sorry, John counsels caution. If you turn over the page to me to uh, to John, it's very rare that you ever uh, read this tiny letter at the back of the Bible. It's on page 1162, but there's a fascinating sentence in there. John recognizes that we pursue community in this way. We, we want to communicate because we need to be loved and we need to love. And, and this is what he says to this woman that he's writing to, verse 12 of, John, of 2 John. I have much to write to you, but I do not want to use paper and ink. Instead, I hope to visit you and talk with you face to face so that our joy may be complete. You see how he makes use of technology. He's not afraid of it. Pen and ink, that was the technology of his day. It allowed communication to travel far beyond his own uh, existence. But at the same time, he recognizes its limitations. What he realizes is that FaceTime is not as good as face-to-face time. However many pixels we have on our computer, it is not as good as embodied real-life communication. So not only is communication accelerating faster than uh, than a speeding bullet, communication means community. Now you see me, now you don't. We need to be loved and we need to love. And so just to wrap things up, human beings are made to communicate. Communication is a good thing. Digital media, they are good things. They are the environment in which we live. And what I don't want you to hear me say at all is, let's all be Luddites and try and turn the clock back and lay down our mobile phones or our smartphones and just kind of, you know, say no to technology. 
That is not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is we need to be aware that digital media, they touch our hearts. They do something to us. So it's important to recognize that the reason we value our devices, the reason uh, that we, uh, we want to be part of this digital age is because we need to know and be known and we need to love and be loved. And we've got to guard against those two things becoming, for us, our sense of significance. Where actually, how many likes we get on Facebook brings us that sense of significance. How many people have had that temptation? I have. There's nothing like it when you're birth of a child and you get 345 likes and you're thinking, yes, I've got a lot of friends, it's good. You know, when you post something up about church and you get one like, it's a bit disappointing. And you think, oh, they know it's me on Sunday. Oh, I've only got one like. No, see. That was not a request for you to send in loads of likes. Okay, that would just feed, feed the problem. So how can we avoid those sorts of temptations? Well, the reality is trying harder, it doesn't work. Discipline, kind of the iron will. We'll succeed for a, a day, a week, maybe even a month, but eventually we'll go back to our devices because the desire to communicate is, is just being human. That's what these devices are selling back to us. And it must be satisfied we really do need to know and be known. We do need to, be, to love and be loved. And so, as Christians, we've got to understand that the only communication that is truly satisfying is God's communication to us in the person of Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh. You see, it is as we see Jesus that we, we know what we need to know. He tells us the big picture, the story of God's great plan of salvation. He tells us how we turned away from our relationship with God and how God pursued us because he wants relationship with us, he wants to communicate with us and became a human being to save and rescue us. He wants to tell us what we need to know, but he also tells us that we are known. Jesus died for us because he loves us. And he knows us inside out. He knows us better than anybody. It's only in Jesus that we recognize that he calls us to love others. And he calls us to love others because he loves us unconditionally. And so we don't need to worry about how many followers we have on Twitter or how many likes we receive on a Facebook post or how many comments we get or how many people read our blog. When we look at Jesus, we know that we are loved unconditionally. We can receive his grace. We can know what it means to be his children adopted into his family. And it is only then, that is the first step. That's what we need to put in place to be disciples in the digital age, to, to live the virtuous life in the virtual age. And it's when we find our significance in Jesus, not in mobile communication, not in digital media, then we can begin to put in place some of those practical safeguards, habits, and disciplines. And so you might want to make sure you have something to say when you say it. You might want to ensure that when you look back at your posts on Facebook, that you share your faith and not just events in your life that people know who you really are, that you are yourself. You might want to ensure that you pass on news, important news to your family before you post it up on Facebook, just in case they're not on Facebook. Joanne caught me when uh, at the birth of Orla. I was about to pop out a, a, a photo on Facebook and she said, can you just text my family and your family? <laughs> she was quite right to tell me to do that. When you come home from work, put your smartphone on its charger on a shelf by the door and leave it there. You can hear a penny drop. It's just a radical solution. Do not go to bed with your mobile phone. Who uses their mobile phone as an alarm? Stop it, all of you, now. Simple. That will 
really help with what can become a digital addiction. But all these practical things that I'd love to encourage you to do, and I am telling you, I'm preaching to myself as much as to you, because these are things, if you ask Joanne, I do them all. But to begin that journey together, we must find our significance. Not in the responses we get, not in the need to know or be known, not in the need to love or be loved, but in Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Now we're going to do something in a minute, a little bit different. I hope that's okay. If you've got your mobile phone on you, can you keep it out? And we're going to do a little uh, kind of symbol, sign at the beginning of this series together that we want to say it's in Jesus that we find who we are. We find that we are we're known, that we're loved, and that that's enough. We're going to say no to our devices that say to us, you can find your significance in me. And we're going to say no, I can only find my significance in Jesus. And so in a moment, I'm going to ask you if you are willing. As we're going to stand, we're going to worship together. And during that time, I'd love you just to come forward up onto the stage and just place your mobile phone here at the foot of the cross. Don't worry, I'm not going to confiscate it. Yeah, and uh, just leave it there. Just see where you've put it. And uh, I'll watch over them so nobody can come and take it away. Don't worry, look at that. You can feel the anxiety. Um, and, uh, and we'll see how we do that. If you've got any questions, come and grab me as we're worshipping. That's, that's fine. But let's just, uh, shall we stand?